Good morning to those that are watching online, probably myself 40 times after this. But um, good morning. It's good to see you guys. <laughs> so uh, last week, Burks, uh, he, his sermon, he went through uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, and then he spoke about verse 3, but mainly verses uh, 8 through 12. And he spoke about uh, leading a quiet life, what it looks like to lead a quiet life. And what stood out to me from that was that ending there in verse 12, that it expresses that a quiet life is one that isn't dependent on anybody. And it's one that from leading that life, it's an example to outsiders. And I was looking on a guy's uh, laptop in the library yesterday, but the quote said that you're never fully dressed until you put on or wear a smile. So basically, you're a little bit naked if you don't smile. But um, who in the past week, Burke wanted me to ask, who in the past week made a point to smile more? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. You were aware of the sermon, you heard it, and you made a point to smile more. Okay. Well, if you don't get anything out of what I share today, <laughs> apply what Burke, you know, he, there's a lot of things from the message, but apply what, uh, you know, his application or his challenge was, is to make a point to smile more. You know, it says in scripture that from a man's heart, his mouth speaks. You know, what's inside of us will show through our countenance. So, yeah, just uh, take Burke up uh, on that challenge. Um, I'm going to, right now, uh, I was listening all the way through uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, the whole chapter, before getting ready for this message. And, um, you know, you can go through it pretty quickly. But as I was listening through it, I realized just it's good to get context with what you're looking at. So we're going to actually read all of chapter 4. And, I might, and that may seem... Uh, like a lot, but we're going to do that so that we understand what I'm speaking out of uh, today and um, how that relates to the, the whole point of what we're looking at. But um, I'm going to start. You see, as you're going through First Thessalonians, that the first three chapters, Paul is just praising the Thessalonians of the things that they're doing. It's not like the letter to, uh, you know, the letters to Corinth, the things that they're doing. And as he's doing that, he's praising them. He's expressing that even you guys are an example to an entire region. And when he gets to chapter 4, he expresses that it's just he starts in reminding them of some things that they're doing, but to continue in those things. And I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to uh, just express what we're going to be looking at. But it says, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Make it your ambition to leave a, lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him according to the Lord's own word. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we, are who still are, we who are still alive are left to, 
be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And today we're going to be looking at verses 13 and 14. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And I, don't, I know in uh, reading certain passages, there will be some things as you, you're reading it that seem like just millimeters on the page that they stand out to you. And then there'll be other aspects of verses that stand like skyscrapers. It's clear that God's trying to emphasize that part of a verse. And for me, when I was looking at this, right there at the end of verse 13, who have no hope. In verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again right here at the end. We believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So today, really, you can contrast verse 13. It says, those who have no hope. We're going to look at hope, and we're going to look at just the promise that Jesus is going to bring with him us, those who believe in his name. And you can contrast uh, verse 13 with Ephesians 2.12 that says that before you were in Christ, you had no citizenship in Israel. You were, you were without hope. And we got to ask ourselves, you know, are we living any different than people that aren't in Christ? Are we living with a different hope? Or are we living just like everybody else? Because it says before Christ, we had no hope. Now we have hope. And don't live like you don't have any hope. We have hope. Um, this is kind of geeky, but I'm, I'm kind of geeky. But who knows what saga started uh, May 25th, 1977. The first movie came out. Oh, wow. I thought we were going to have like two or three people in here. But I'm not really a huge Star Wars fan, but I'm obviously a geek enough to mention that. But what, do you all remember what the name of the first movie was? Okay, yeah, I gave it away. Um, so it was, in hindsight, it's episode four, and it's called A New Hope. So I'm going to take some time and pray, but I, y'all know I'm corny. I named the message today, episode three, A True Hope. So um, it's, my, it's my third message, so yeah, I had to be corny. But I'm going to uh, take some time right now and pray, and then uh, just, yeah, I'll bow your heads and pray with me. God, I, I thank you for today. Thank you for this awesome opportunity. God, I pray that through your spirit, you would fill me in my innermost being with strength and confidence. God, I pray that uh, just the congregation here, those that are listening, God, that you would free our minds from distractions and help us hear what in the world it is that you want us to apply from this message. Let us hear you. Let us take what we've heard away and let it change us forever. God, help us through your spirit, take the words that are expressed, God, and nail them home in our hearts. And God, I just, I just pray you would bless the time. Help me uh, express all of what I want to share, God, and we just pray that you would bless the time. Uh, amen. amen. So Bert and I headed down to Winston-Salem this past uh, Tuesday, and uh, Bert said, we're apparently, I mean, the whole message is not about the dark side, but uh, Star Wars or anything, but Bert said, we're apparently the dark side. And I said, Bert, what are you talking about? I don't even know how we got on the topic I wasn't talking about in the message or anything. I said, but what are you talking about? And he said, well, the Jedi have problems with the absolutes. So we believe in the absolute. So we're apparently on the dark side. So long live the dark side. But anyway, uh, Vader and Kylo, um, we're first going to look at what is hope. So that's what we're going to start off with. What is hope? And um, I, like I said, I'm corny. I, I came up with a kind of an acronym with hope. It's having our perspective eternal. I didn't listen to any message. I didn't listen to any sermon. So if it's stolen, I was born too late to be original. Um, having our hope eternal. Um, having our perspective eternal. I just screwed up. Having our perspective eternal. And I worried about that when I, when I made the acronym because I was thinking in English, we don't really do that. We don't put the adjective after, you know, what it's describing. But there is, lo and behold, such thing as a post-positive adjective. So having our perspective eternal. So anyway, I'm going to read the Webster's 1828 definition of hope. Um, 
And in that, just listen, because I was trying to figure out what in the world is the difference in hope and faith and grace and peace and all these words that are all throughout the Bible. It says, hope differs from wish and desire in this, that it implies some expectation of obtaining the good desired or the possibility of possessing it. Hope, therefore, always gives pleasure or joy, whereas wish and desire may produce or be accompanied with pain and anxiety. So you can wish and desire for something and have no expectation that you're, act, you're actually going to get it. Hope is different. Hope is accompanied with an expectation that you're actually going to get what you're longing for. Um, I, was, I was questioning, what's the difference in hope and faith? Hope is a byproduct of faith. Hope is built on the foundation of faith. Um, some person shared this. It says, faith is the trust in something based in evidence and hope is the resulting confidence from that trust going forward. That was me. Um, so we're going we're gonna to look at what is our hope. You know, we, we're looking at hope. Um, we're going to look at what is our hope. What causes us to have hope? Uh, I think it will be up on the slide. I know I'm kind of going out of order. But First Thessalonians 1.3, to going through the book, it shares... We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is our fuel. It's our fuel for endurance. That's what hope is. I was reading Jeremiah 14 this morning, and Jesus is described a little bit earlier in Jeremiah, but it may be in that chapter, but Jesus is described as the hope of Israel. God is our hope. And um, it, says, uh, it says in verse uh, 22 of chapter 14, Do any of, these, of the worthless idols of the nations bring rain? Do the skies themselves send down showers? No, it is you, Lord our God. Therefore, our hope is in you, for you are the one who does all this. So loosely, obviously, if somebody's going to be sharing a message from the Bible, um, God is our hope. He himself is our hope. He is the one that gives us hope. But we're practically going to look at what is our hope resting in? And it's uh, coming out of Romans 8, um, verses 19 through 23. But it says, The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So our hope, our expectation is this, that creation would be restored. Salvation. Salvation is our hope. Uh, I was reading that salvation, we just so often stop there at salvation. You're not saved. Well, you need to get saved. Salvation, end of the story. Salvation is for the entire creation, not just for us. It's for the entire creation. When you think about salvation, I know, I know myself, I just think about humans, us. You know, that's it. Salvation is for the entire creation. Um, look at John 14, uh, 1 through 5. Jesus sheds light on what our hope is to be in. It says, do not let Jesus is sassy. I love Jesus and his humor. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am. I like verse 5 because my name's there and he always does this, but... Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And um, anyway, Jesus described heaven. Heaven is our hope. That's our hope. Salvation. Heaven is our hope. Um, Jesus is describing there that heaven is a place. Where he's went, he's going to come back and bring us there with him. It's a place. Um, Burke and I also talked about this, but bad, it's, a, it's like a two-hour drive. 
bad information results in wrong beliefs and in turn lousy outcomes or consequences. Bad information results in wrong beliefs and lousy outcomes. I've had bad information about heaven for quite a while in my life, and some of you probably have bad information right now about heaven, and it's causing wrong beliefs. Um, two of the things that cause me not and us, just as Christians, not to desire heaven, one of them is that heaven is often depicted as a figurative place. You know, I, I talk to people all the time that say, well, you know, I don't, you know hell's not an actual place in the church. You know, that, that's what their beliefs are, that hell's not a place. But heaven is often depicted as a figurative place. Um, I read this uh, wise theologian, he expressed, it is often found at the end of the books, as the end, the culmination of human life, with only enough attention given to it to end the story. However, instead of teaching that heaven is the stopping point, the finale of life, the Bible teaches something quite different. It is rather just the beginning of life as intended originally at creation. A wise theologian was Thomas Franklin Saunders IV. It's 2018. So. But uh, um, I, I want to read this poem. I thought it would have been, uh, I thought it would have been cool if I could remember, uh, memorize this, memorize it. But um, Calvin Miller expressed, um, I can't even uh, pronounce memorize. You know, I didn't memorize the poem. It says, I, I just want you all to listen to this and listen how may your desires in your heart right now in relation to heaven be off. What he says is, I once scorned every, fright, uh, every fearful thought of death when it was but the end of pulse and breath. But now my eyes have seen that past the pain, there is a world that's waiting to be claimed. Earth maker holy, let me now depart for living such a temporary art. And dying is but getting dressed for God. Our graves are merely doorways cut and sod. It's Calvin Miller. And um, I mean, even the, the books, as I was preparing for this, you know, I was like, I want to look at the you know, systematic theology or these different books. I want to learn about heaven. Guess where it's at in the book? At the, <laughs> at the end, you know. It's talked about throughout the Bible, but where do we get you know, most of the light shed on heaven at the end. You know, so often heaven is depicted as the end. In your hearts, as you're, you're viewing heaven, is it a stopping point? Because that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not how we should be viewing heaven. That's going to highly determine how we live our lives now if we see heaven as something that's it. That's it. That's the stopping point. It's only a transition. I like this. Um, you think about a new car. Somebody says they're going to get a new car. Do you struggle to try to figure out what that object would look like? You know, no, it's a car. You know, you not, may not know the brand, the make, the model, the year, but it's a car. You know, when, when the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth, do you struggle to wonder what that would be like? You know, a new resurrected body? Do we go, I wonder what a body is? You know, no. So why, when we think about heaven, do we just clock out, you know, and just think about this? I, I think, you ever seen the Matrix where he's in the room and it's just blank white, you know? All we're going to be doing is singing, you know, songs, praises, harps, white, boring, you know, that's it. That's not heaven. Um, out of the drama of Scripture, it expresses a comprehensive, this is the second uh, fault or bad information that a lot of people, there's a lot of them, but this is the, the second one that I have. It says, Life in heaven is depicted as a mindless, disembodied state. Listen to this from the drama of Scripture. A comprehensive redemption also means that human cultural development and work will continue. There will be opportunity for humankind to continue to work and develop the creation, but now released from the burden of sin. I know y'all might be hearing that and going, I thought were, this was supposed to be encouraging. You're talking about work. But... Uh, it, if you read Revelations and you look through Scripture, you get a fuller picture from the different aspects, how Jesus taught about it, but even how John's, God's speaking through John and describing of what heaven actually looks like. In heaven, we will eat, we will worship, we will drink, we will learn, we will travel, and we will work. What do y'all remember about 
the work in the beginning. A lot of people think, I was talking about parents, it's been about a year ago, but I, I know I often think about work as the curse. That's not what the Bible depicts. Work wasn't the curse. You know, Genesis 1.28 and then uh, Genesis like 2.19 and 20, Adam had work. He had a job. What did he need a helper for if he didn't have work? You know, he, he had things to do. He was to name the animals. You know, uh, he says to Adam and Eve, he told them, you're to have dominion. Be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion over everything here, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. That's your work. You had work. That wasn't the curse. Worse, work wasn't the curse. The curse was that work would become uh, laborsome. You know, work by the sweat of your brow, you would work. So I know it's, it's really hard for us to imagine, but life continues. You think about earth now, it's a new earth. It, it's earth restored or renewed, not this mindless blank state. It's life continuing. I don't have a lot of motivation a lot of times about heaven because I think this is it. It stops. No, this just continues, but without the curse of sin, the evil that comes from sin. Jesus gives an idea of what will be like in heaven. Um, in Luke 24, uh, 36 through 43, once again, um, I, I just read Jesus' humor uh, in this, and I love it. But uh, it's 36 through 43. It expresses, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Right, like, boo, scared them. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? <laughs> they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Jesus had a body. Jesus ate, he talked, he walked. He was recognizably himself. Now, the kind of cool thing about this is, um, I, I, like I said, the geek and the gamer aspect tries to rise back up in me. But if you look at John 20, 19, and 26, they're there, and it makes a point to emphasize that they're in a locked room. And in verse 19, Jesus just shows up in the locked room. It doesn't say he walked through the door, like he opened it and unlocked it. He just shows up. So our bodies, they will be bodies. Don't try to think of some random object we can't imagine when it says a resurrected body. It's a body, but we also will have abilities that we don't have right now. And that should excite us. That should make us excited. When we're playing basketball, we'll say game sliders from like 2K. What it is is that in video games, there's default settings, and you can mess around with those things and change all kinds of stuff about what's going on. Do we realize that sin has screwed up what we should be, you know, how we should live, what we should be able to do? And um, like I said, I think of Minecraft and Halo and stuff where you up the percentage on the shields and things like that, but half of y'all probably have no idea what um, I'm talking about. But uh, anyway, just when you think about heaven, do not see it as a stopping point. Do not try to even justify in your mind that, I'm not really even sure what it would be like. What do you understand earth is? What are earthly things? Because heaven is a new earth. Don't try to make it so distant in your mind that you don't understand it. Something that even if we, I set up here and I described it theologically without a doubt exactly as it is, God's word says that no mind has imagined. You know, we, we cannot come up with what God, no eye has seen what God has in store for us. So right now I'm going to talk about what are some things that inhibit their hope inhibitors that keep us from having hope. The first one is the eternal versus finite or the sacred versus the secular divide. Um, St. Augustine said in, the, in his confessions, um, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So one of the things that inhibits us from having hope is that we don't realize the state that we're in as a result of the fall. You know, we don't, we don't realize why humanity 
all of humanity longs for something more while at the same time trying to convince itself, this is it. This is all I know. No, this is it. Uh, I read Oz Guinness's Fool's Talk and Francis Schaeffer's The God Who Is There, and they just show throughout culture how brilliant minds have struggled with this, this divide. We're just human, but there's so much you know, out of this world about us. It says in philosophy, art, music, and culture, you think of Van Gogh, I'm going to botch these names, Cezanne, Picasso, Mondrian, Dylan Thomas, Drake should recognize that name because the poem he shares is, you know, um, do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Um, those people, the art, the brilliance that they expressed all throughout their lives, they were struggling with despair because they were convinced of their atheism, but they knew in them that there was something more. And don't, don't be like that. Don't wrestle like that. Don't realize, you know, I have this hunger and this desire that cannot be quenched by anything here, but I'm still going to try to quench it by things here. Go to God. You know, seek God and understand there is no other source of living water but Him. Um, the second thing that inhibits our joy is not believing God's good. Just not walking around believing God's good. It's been about two or three weeks, but Burke shared Hebrews 11.6 with me uh, at the atrium. And everybody, in a sense, has some way heard about Hebrews 11.6. Um, it says it is impossible to please God without faith. Somehow I lost my phone. Everybody knows that part of the verse. You know, most people know that part of the verse. What a lot of people forget or don't realize about the verse is the second half of the verse. It's impossible to please God without faith because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And Burke asked me, he said, when you walk around as you're going throughout your life, are you neutral? Are you negative, you know, pessimistic? Or do you walk around expecting God to reward you with good? And I said, I definitely not the latter. You know, I just don't do that. The, one of the biggest things that will contribute to you having hope is realizing that the God that we serve is good. If anything can define good, God is the definition of good. Understand that. You know, Psalm 103, uh, the psalmist is telling his soul, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. You know, I heard uh, it was in a, in a, expressing a song, the per, ler, person leading worship was expressing, sometimes we say things because we understand and believe them. Other times we say things so we understand and believe them. And I'm not talking about being uh, brainwashed or just, you know, trying to convince yourself of something that's not true. Scripture speaks about renewing your mind. You know, not being conformed to this world, but renewing your mind, washing your soul with the word. Are we doing that? When you, when, when you think about yourself, what do you think? When you think about God, that's what Tozer said. The most important thing about a person is what they think when they think about God. You know, what do you think about when you think about God? Do you walk around realizing that he's good and that he wants to reward you? Burke also challenged me, 1 Peter 2, 9 I, I clearly saw just there, he said, I want to challenge you every day. And I'm, I'm challenging you guys right now if he hadn't already challenged you. First Peter 2, 9. Find scripture that describes you. Look yourself in the mirror and command your soul to see yourself for how you are. You know, I don't have all of 1 Peter 2, 9 uh, memorized. You think if I said it, you know, every day for the past month that I haven't memorized. But in that, it expresses we are chosen. We are part of a royal nation. We're holy, and we're God's special possession. Imagine how differently you would live life if you believed that walking around each day, you know, if you understood that. That's an that's uh, application or a challenge from this. Um, one of the other things that keeps us from having hope and inhibits our hope is alienated living. Um, what I thought about in Scripture, uh, Drake and I were going through this. Drake didn't realize he helped me prepare the message. But uh, Luke 16 expresses, there chapter 16, uh, verses 8 and 9, it says, The master commanded the dishonest manager because he had 
commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. You know, those are, I had to look back. I was telling Drake when I read this, I had to look back at verse 1 and says, oh, okay, Jesus said this. You know, Jesus is telling them, we understand how to remove ourselves from worldly things and not be caught up in the things that are deemed wrong, you know, that we see as blatant sins. We do not do a good job of living life and here on this earth, here, you know, being in the midst of, of life, interacting with people, being around them. I was reading uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, and I think, you know, Solomon went, put himself through a lot of stuff, but as a result of it, he learned what not to do. And uh, in Ecclesiastes, I'll read a few verses just to give you an idea of what it looks like not to live an alienated life, separated, just on the defensive away from the things we shouldn't be doing, but to really live life. It says, For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, chasing after wind. He says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift of God. This is what I have observed to be good, that is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. And this verse here is kind of expressing uh, what it, it's understanding what it looks like to walk in this world and not be alienated from it. It says it is a good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. You know, and in that, just understanding, all right, I know I'm told not to do these things. What does it look like for me? Even uh, money comes up in Luke 16. We know that doesn't mean not to have money. You know, that you're a sinner if you have wealth. Just an example. It, that's not what God's speaking about. You don't want to alienate yourself from everything. It's understanding where is my heart in doing these things? You know, am I participating in these things for the building of the kingdom? Am I using my resources for my heart, you know, my treasures, or for building treasures in heaven, you know, for what God wants from me? One of the last ones I put is uh, hypocrisy. And um, I want to read uh, this because this has been called the Achilles heel of Christianity, which is hypocrisy. There's an emperor that died in A.D. 362 by the name of Julian. Um, he had failed his attempt to return Rome to pagan gods of his ancestors. And uh, his name is Julian. He rejected Constantine's move towards the Christian faith. He worked energetically to restore the pagan gods and values of classical Rome, but he died. So in hindsight, we look at that and we go, ah, it wasn't a real threat. He died. You know, it didn't result in what he was after. Listen to this. Had Julian lived, one reason for his potential success was that he knew his Christian opponents well, and his clever strategy against them was based on his intimate knowledge of how they behaved. For one thing, it is highly probable that Julian's parents were Christian. In other words, Julian's attacks on the faith were powerful because they were an insider's attacks. For another, Julian was an able philosopher soldier who was said to be the best thinker to wear the imperial purple since Marcus Aurelius. Most intriguingly of all, Julius's design include a canny reliance on what he knew was the Achilles heel of the Christian faith, hypocrisy. 
our constant Christian failure to practice what we preach, walk what we talk. But he also counted on the well-known Christian capacity for division and strife that ran directly counter to Jesus' call for unity in his prayer before his arrest. This is it. I know it's like, well, gosh, is he preaching? Is he just going to read everything? Julian even calculated that counting on Christian hypocrisy, he could use toleration to deliberately foster Christian disunity. This is it right here. So when he became emperor, he called the Christian bishops together and told them to sort out their differences and live in peace, knowing that that was probably the best way to intensify the differences and destroy their unity. Experiences had taught him, he remarked to those around, no wild beasts are as dangerous to man as Christians are to each other. Um, you know, it's obviously he wasn't a Christian, so he's going to badmouth Christians, but there's truth, you know, in what he's expressing. Um, you know, I talked about the mirror challenge. I thought this was kind of cool because I found the verse. I was thinking of the verse, couldn't remember exactly where it was at in James in reference to it, but listen to what it says. James 1, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So we, we've, we've got to understand, we always want to live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel. That's what God has asked us to do. We've got to understand, you know, am, am I understanding my state after the fall? You know, am I walking around not believing God is good? Am I alienating myself from the world or am I living in it? You know, am I living a life of hypocrisy? You know, it says, he who's faithful in little will be, you know, faithful in much. You'll be trusted. He who's, tr you know, trustworthy in little will be trusted with much. With what you have, are you being sincere? Are you being authentic, you know, with it, your faith? Um, the last kind of thing to think about I thought was cool in, in the depiction of heaven, listen to this and let it feed your thoughts, your meditations about heaven, our hope. No death, no suffering, no funeral homes, abortion clinics, or psychiatric wards. No rape, missing children, or drug rehabilitation centers. No bigotry, no bigotry, no muggings or killings, no warrior depression or economic downturns. No wars, no unemployment, no anguish over failure and miscommunication. No con men, no locks, no death, no mourning, no pain, no boredom. No arthritis, no handicaps, no cancer. No taxes. I'll read that again. No taxes. <laughs> no bills. Amen. No computer crashes. No weeds. No bombs. No drunkenness. No traffic jams. Accidents. Septic tank backups. No mental illness. No unwanted emails. Close friendships, but no clicks. Laughter, but no put downs. Intimacy, but no temptation to immorality. No hidden agendas. No backroom deals. No betrayals. Imagine mealtimes full of stories, laughter and joy without fear of insensitivity, inappropriate behavior, anger, gossip, lust, jealousy, hurt feelings, or anything that eclipses joy. That will be heaven. Um, Psalm 1611 says that in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are treasures forevermore. When we're in heaven, his kingdom, you know, that prayer you know, the Lord's Prayer, His kingdom will have come. He will be here with us. We will live with Him. We will have joy forever, for we'll be in His presence. Um, two kind of things to close or to ending uh, in relation to this, uh, two verses. Um, it's Second Peter 3.11. I don't think I uh, got that one up there. I'll find it look at it, but it's chapter 3, and it's uh, verses 11 through 13. If Tommy remembers where things are in the Bible. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? 
You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. Uh, Hebrews 11 speaks about, and we hope, this would be my prayer for us, that this describes us. Um, it's Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. It says, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. When you think about earth, when you think about country, when you think about city, don't try to imagine something that you don't understand. Realize that heaven is a continuation of life free from the consequences of sin. Life continues. How are you living in light of that now to know, am I storing up my treasures for then or am I storing up my treasures for now? Um, we're the product of our surroundings, you know, and our choices are the, the result of those surroundings. We can soil our souls with repeated washing in wickedness. You know, we, we know as humans, I was talking about those guys that lived a life of despair, discouragement. We know that we were created for eternity, but what are we surrounding ourselves with? Are we around hopeful people? Are we being hopeful people? You know, are, are we pouring in what causes us to have hope? Or are we trying to drown it out? Hope is not easily achieved. It's not something you can just decide to have one day. Anything, this is last two, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly to begin with. Anything worth having doesn't come easy. Understand our longings since the fall. You know, understand that God is good. Walk what you talk and know what our hope is. Our hope is in heaven. God is our hope, but our hope is in heaven. Um, I just want to take some time uh, right now. There's a lot of different things with um, our divide being eternal, knowing God's good, you know, the challenge of looking in the mirror and commanding your soul to bless the Lord, telling your soul, you know, I'm not going to see myself based on how I feel, but what God says about me, him based on his word, not living separated, you know, from society, but living in it and really enjoying life because we understand it's short and not being a hypocrite. You know, the, the small things that God's entrusted us with, being faithful and sincere with them. But um, right now I'm just going to pray for us, um, pray for the time to close it, and then the uh, band can come up. But um, God, I, I thank you um, for today. Uh, God, I thank you for this time. God, it just, it, it goes by. Um, God, the only way that we can... Um, care and really stay and be faithful to what you shared with us is through your spirit, God, through your strength, with your help. And um, God, I do pray that when we think about heaven, we would understand that it's a real place. God, we're not going to be disembodied, not going to be separated from it. God, we're not mindless. We're going to be alive just as we're alive now, but free from the consequences of sin. And God, I just pray when we think about you, we see you as you are, as good. God, because of that, as a result of that, when we think about ourselves, we see ourselves for who we are, holy, righteous, royal, special, chosen. And God, I pray that that would change how we interact with each other. God, that we wouldn't, the church wouldn't tear itself apart from the inside out, but God, that we would be an example to the world. We are a city on the hill. And um, God, we just, we praise you and we thank you. Give us the strength to do these things. There's a lot of different things, but give us one or two things just to take away and apply and remember for the rest of our lives. And God, we just, we praise you and we thank you for you are good. Um, amen.